Um, now we move on to the next presentation on um, um, modified aptamers as replacement for antibodies in diagnostic and therapeutics. And we by Dr. Casey uh, Woodward. Uh, he's head of business development at Aptamer Group, Heslington, York, United Kingdom. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to this talk today. Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking the organisers for giving me the chance to present some of the research and the work which we're conducting at Aptamer Group today. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a brief overview of Aptamer te technology uh, and sort of specifically talk to you a little bit about some of the applications in the diagnostic and therapeutic areas. So for those of you who are not familiar with Aptamer technology, an Aptamer is essentially a piece of nucleic acid, uh, whether that's DNA, RNA, or a modified library, uh, which is single-stranded and able to fold into a 3D shape, which allows it to bind to a target of interest. Now, they're often referred to as nucleic acid antibodies, but we think uh, that that's not really a fair comparison. The, the way in which they work is slightly different, and they've got a number of different traits uh, to antibodies. So, most namely, this includes the the uh, selection process, the way in which they're raised, uh, and because it's entirely in vitro, this presents a number of advantages over using an immune system to generate an affinity reagent. So that means that targets which are toxic or non-immunogenic um, are able to have an affinity reagent raised to them. Uh, we're not limited to biological conditions, so aptamers can be designed to work in quite harsh environments like seawater, uh, in areas of high solvents, uh, and we can also use, uh, we can target specificity by using cross, uh, by using counter selection, which is something which I'm going to explore in a little while. Uh, and interestingly, Aptimus combined to a whole range of different targets, going from small molecules, things like antibiotics and, and uh, metabolites, all the way through, through peptides and proteins, up to whole organisms. So Aptimus are able to bind very nicely to viruses, to fungi, to bacteria, uh, and mammalian cells. And I'll show you some applications of that um, towards the end. So at the moment, the affinity reagent market is dominated by antibodies. And there's a, a good reason for that in the sense that they do work well for most applications. However, there are a number of applications, a number of areas in which an antibody is less well suited than an aptima. And so what you can see on the left-hand side here is um, several points in which an aptima can be used, uh, well, several traits in which an aptima can, can be beneficial. So that, as you can see from the panel on the right, an aptima is much smaller. An aptima is only maybe five to six kilodaltons, whereas a, an IgG can be kind of uh, 150 kilodaltons. And so that small size, as we've heard earlier on, can um, facilitate excellent cell permeability. It can mean that more of the affinity reagent can bind to a target, therefore boosting signal. They're non-immunogenic, so there's no risk of having uh, any kind of inflammation from usage, and they also have a very highly flexible structure. Now, if we look at the structure of an antibody, you can see you've got several, uh, di uh, sorry, several um, disulfide bonds, which give them a very rigid structure uh, and not particularly amenable for, for being flexible, whereas an aptima can switch its shape to allow for binding and elution under specific conditions. Now, if we look at the kinetics of, of uh, antibodies versus aptimas, I wanted to include this slide to really address a common misconception, that is that aptimers don't bind as well as antibodies. Now, what you can see quite clearly here, that in the top panel, we've got a, an antibody which um, shows a slow association rate uh, and a slow dissociation rate, whereas an aptima in this example uh, shows a particularly good um, association rate and similarly a slow dissociation rate. And so, Therefore, they can be used uh, for a lot of the applications in which antibodies are currently used for as well. And so then the panel below just illustrates some of the numbers to go with that data set. Now, one of the uh, key advantages of using aptimers um, is actually the downstream production. So uh, in, during, the select, during raising an aptima, a lot of the problem is finding the initial sequence for the, which the aptima will bind. Uh, but once we've identified that sequence, the actual manufacture is very straightforward. Uh, 
If we remember that an aptamer is simply just an oligonucleotide, it can be synthesized in, in the same way which primers are as well, so which is typically done through large-scale chemical synthesis using things like solid phase synthesis as well, which is a very well-established technology. We can implement very strict quality control steps to ensure that the batch to batch variation is, is negligible uh, and, and make sure we're always getting a nice high yield. And also, if we think um, antibodies tend to require storage at four degrees in the presence of things like sodium azide to prevent bacterial inf um, growth. An aptamer can be stored dry and lysophilized, it can be stored in large volumes, and it can be stored at room temperature as well, which is a really big advantage. If you think that we can still dig up dinosaur bones and find DNA present, that kind of gives you a little bit of an indication to show that your aptamer is probably likely to outlive you as the researcher um, rather than going off. So how do we go about identifying aptamers? Well, it helps to think about the structure of an aptamer to begin with. So an aptamer tends to be a random region, um, which is, in our case, about 40 nucleotides long, uh, comprised of the four bases, or more in some cases, and it's flanked by two primer regions, which allow it to be PCR'd up, um, sort of post-identification. Now, what this, what this random region allows us to do is create a highly diverse library, um, which can be up into a kind of one times 10 to the, to the power of 15 um, different sequences per library, and, and that far exceeds what's available with chemical and peptide libraries. Now this uh, the, the process, once, once we've identified this library, what we tend to do is incubate a target with the library and see what binds, and simply wash away anything which doesn't bind. So it's a very straightforward, logical approach, and after that, and Anything which binds is uh, eluted and PCR'd up, whereas anything which doesn't bind is simply discarded. Now, some, as I've mentioned earlier, some of the, some of the advantages to using this in vitro, uh, in vitro approach is that we're not limited to biological systems. We can change our salt conditions and pH to mirror the final assay buffer that's used. We can control the kinetics. We can add target and reduce target to improve or uh, decrease affinities of the resultant aptamers. We can give these aptamers bespoke properties. We can make it, in the case of purification, we can make aptamers which will bind to a target and also let go of a target under different uh, buffer conditions, which is great for trying to purify things like therapeutic proteins. And we can introduce counter selection. And this is really important because this allows us to remove anything which we, any aptamers in the population which we don't want to bind to a closely related species. And therefore we can uh, create great levels of specificity. And that's kind of demonstrated in this slide. So what you can see here is the aptamer on the left-hand side recognizes three conformations of a, of a protein. Now that's not truncations, that's not mutations, that's literally simply three different fold structures. Now after counter selection, we've removed it by any recognition to the green um, form, um, and so obviously uh, affinity is, is ablated, but it still allows recognition to the other two. And in the interest of time, I won't linger on too much, but just to show that aptamers are highly stable. And this, this is in uh, cell, uh, cell culture buffer. Um, and even after a week, these aptamers are still stable uh, and functional. Because of the way in which we produce them, they're highly amenable to things like conjugation, to things like fluorophores and nanoparticles, biotin, using a range of different conjugation chemistries, making them highly amenable to uh, whatever kind of assay format you, you would like to use things like Western blotting, uh, flow cytometry, um, ELISAs, and so on and so forth. Okay, so just getting to the more nitty gritty now, how can we actually use aptamers to make a difference? Now in this slide, what I've shown here is, is a couple of examples of point of care diagnostics. So on the left hand side, you'll see a lateral flow device, which is obviously commonly used in things like pregnancy testing. An aptamer can be easily conjugated to a gold nanoparticle and be used in exactly the same way as what an antibody is to detect an analyte of interest. More recently, um, there's been examples of these kind of shake and read tests in which an aptima, which is bound to either two fluorophores or a fluorophore and a quencher, upon the target recognition, they come together and that produces a nice clear fluorescent signal which can be read uh, either out in the field or, or kind of in a very basic laboratory. It can be used in traditional applications, so the ALONA is uh, what us aptamer geeks like to call, um, uh, it's, it's like a, an ELISA replacement using oligonucleotides. You can see here that, um, some of 
uh, an example which we did a, a few months ago, and this is just using three different proteins at different concentrations of aptima to give a different readout. They can be used to uh, label cells, so we can be using things like confocal microscopy. They can be used in difficult samples as well, so formalin fixed parafilm embedded. They can be used again, as you can imagine, in, in flow cytometry as well, and you can see here clear shifts to the right where the cells have been labelled and treated. An interesting example, um, which I'll finish the diagnostic slide up on, is um, we were ch challenged by trying to get aptimus to recognise three different forms of, a can of an esophageal cancer line. And what we did was we raised three aptima populations. Now what you can see is that each apt aptima population is raised against a specific stage. So uh, number one is against early cancer, two is against late stage, and three is against a closely related. And you can see that each population has minimal binding to the, close to the, other, um, to the other closely related um, cell line. And this, um, sh this was such a result that it was taken pathologists with 10 years of training to equal these results, uh, and it took us only three months to do, which we think is quite a good, quite a good feat. I'm going to jump ship uh, and change quickly onto therapeutics for the last few minutes. So if you think that anaptomo is simply an oligonucleotide, oligonucleotides have been around for a while in terms of therapeutics, and what you can see here is a few examples of different organs which have been targeted by oligos. Mapogen is a good example, which is particularly, this is actually an aptima, which has been used to treat um, a, uh, ocular degeneration. Uh, and what we're trying to get at is, say, is that no target is undruggable using oligonucleotides, and particularly aptimas. Why are they so great? Well, we've heard a little bit earlier on about some of the downsides, but they have got a number of advantages as well. Obviously, the manufacturing is, is particularly beneficial uh, compared to other biologics. Uh, and in terms of regulation, there's a lot, a lot of um, precedents out there for using those already. Aptimas, due to their conjugation, can be uh, readily conjugated to things like PEG and cholesterol groups to, to uh, improve renal clearance. They can be uh, conjugated to things like disruptor, peptide, uh, disruptor RNAs as well. They can be conjugated to drugs, and they can, we can raise antidotes to them as well by using a complementary sequence. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly whiz through some of these last slides. But what you can see here is aptimus, which are raised against HIV, binding to this GD protein, which prevents viral entry. And you can see here several aptima clones, which have got um, inhibitory properties to prevent internalization of the virus. You can see here conjugation of aptimus to, uh, to doxorubicin to uh, elicit a cytotoxic response. So the control line has minimal effect. But in the target cell line, there's a nice uh, cytotoxic response. They can be conjugated to things like sRNAs, and so the aptum is therefore used as a delivery mechanism to really get the, get the, uh, the business end, the microRNA, to, uh, to where you want to use it. And to kind of step back to kind of more towards the therapeutics, they can be used uh, for um, drug monitoring purposes as well. So to summarize, they're a great tool. They're amenable to lots of different applications. They can be bound to a range of targets. Um, they're compatible with a lot of different formats, and they've shown promise in both therapeutics and diagnostics. And I'd just like to finish by saying that Aptima Group uh, is experts in all of these regions, including biomarker discovery, which I haven't touched upon today. I'd be happy to take any questions which you might have. Thank you. Casey, thanks for that. I had a question when you talk about using um, aptimus to pre prevent viral entry into the mm. cells to infect. Okay. So I think the example that you used there was actually HSV and not oh, HIV. Okay. Sorry. But with respect to HIV, mm. one of the big problems for treating HIV, so there's been a lot of um, investment by different drug companies looking at entry inhibitors from a small molecule perspective. With obviously, the, the approach would be similar for an aptima, I would assume. The big limitation for those is basically being biodistribution. The problem with, with virus like HIV is it mainly resides in lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. So penetration of the drugs themselves into the lymph nodes is quite poor. Is there any data to suggest that an aftermer approach would be better from that perspective? It's a good question. Uh, so in terms of um, sort of specific targeting with aptimers, um, 
it's most of the work so far has been done targeting uh, the top, well, looking at apps with the topical application, uh, because of the half-life can be quite limited. Um, the clearance can be um, quite quite quick without modification by things like PEG and cholesterol. Um, there is evidence to show which to show aptamers have got um, tumour penetrating properties, and they can be raised to target tumours. Um, although it's still very early days, and a lot of that work is still ongoing. Um, I can point you in direction to a couple of good papers, which can kind of explain it much better than I can, if you'd like. All right, cheers. I understood that the most aptamers you are making are approximately six kilodalton, and I wonder, uh, have you tried to make them larger? Is it possible to combine uh, aptamers with uh, different specificities into one molecule, for example? Absolutely, absolutely. So what we have done in the past is conjugated um, an aptama recognizing a, um, a surface protein to an aptama which is binding to a target of interest. And what we can do that way is not only does it make it larger, but it also enables better um, entrance into the cell by binding to a receptor which is highly trafficked, so it can go into the cell and therefore um, you know, inhibit whatever enzyme we would like it to as well. You can add things like linker regions on as well um, to kind of increase the size. Um, and I guess that probably some of the new approaches would be uh, conjugating an aptamer to um, other proteins to kind of improve um, the kind of uh, sort of half-life that way. You also mentioned that uh, they were cell permeable. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that means that they're really able to penetrate the plasma membrane or if they just are taken up by endocytosis? Uh, so we, it's a, it's a good question. We, we think there's probably uh, arguments for both. We think that there's probably uh, some kind of active form of internalization of aptamers. Uh, but there is also evidence to show that um, they can cross um, plasma membranes as well, given enough time. Do you have any idea about how they can be able to do that? <laughs> uh, I'm not 100% I'm not sure, to be honest. Fine, thank you. I think we move on to the uh, next presentation.